Hi, I'm Chris Bonsford and welcome to the new Quorum DVD, Fish for Everything. We'll be featuring some of our top anglers fishing different methods on different waters. Now I'm going to have a little go myself now, I'm going to set some gear up, but first we'll go to Gary Knowles who's feeder fishing on a commercial. Okay, this morning we're at Partridge Lakes near Warrington in Cheshire. We've uh, been here about 10 minutes this morning and uh, pretty straight away we're into a decent fish which has took a, one of these uh, oozing boilers, pineapple oozing boiler. And the sun's just got on the water though which maybe it's just got them moving. Feel a bit of warmth on the back. This is the specimen lake. This does feel like a carp, but there could be anything in here. There's a decent sized bream, as well as carp, roach, perch, chub. This one's really pulling quite hard. All the stuff I'm using today, straight out of the packet. The Huxton Island, already prepared. This is definitely pulling a bit harder now, but as you can see, you can really lean into them with these rods without fear of a hook pull. Listen to that clutch, absolutely perfect. A nice boil there. That's so smooth, that clutch. So smooth, especially when you it's really important, especially when you're fishing with short hoot links. You don't want any jarring at all. This feels really smooth. I've not got the heaviest gear on, but as you can see, it's just so nicely balanced. You can put a huge amount of pressure on these fish. There we go. I still haven't seen him. Common carp. There we go. First one of the day in the net. But even on a commercial, I'll, I will always use an unhooking mat. You've got to look after the fish. That's a nice common. I don't know, maybe six or seven pounds, maybe a little more. There you go. All the start of the day. Already I'm getting lots of line bites now. Uh, it could be tempting to strike them, but it's important that you wait until you get a really good drop back or your tip really goes around when you're fishing a, a, a semi-fixed feeder. And the line bites are caused by numbers of fish being around your bait. You catch the line with the pectorals, with the back, and it keeps your tip constantly moving. It's quite, it's quite a good thing to see because you know there's fish over your bait and on your feed, and it's usually the prelude to to getting a decent bite. Just another drop back. Uh, this certainly isn't a carp, or if it is, it's a very small one. It didn't do a great deal. Let's see what it is, this one. Kind of a bitty little bite. Let's see what we've got. Yeah, nice oh, little bream, little skimmer. There we go. Like we said, it's a mixed fishery, so be careful getting up. Fishing for all kinds of fish today. Fish for everything. There we go. Again, to the pineapple boiler. 
Pretty little skimmer. Nice bronze colour. Let's pop him back. Okay, the rig I'm using today is a very simple one, works extremely effectively. It's the Corum Easy Feeder. This is a 30 gram one, they're comfortable casting it about the 15, 20 yards out to where I'm fishing. And straight out the packet, I've got the, the four inch short barbless so hook in size 14, uh, single Sonia bait boiler. Uh, the thing I like about these Easy Feeders is that they, they're almost a hybrid feeder, so you can change your bait without needing to change your feeder. Uh, you can push it, you can push in a ground feed, maggot mix, works extremely well. Uh, all you've got here, I've got the sticky pellets, the Fin Perfect pellets. Just pop it on, it just, just grabs them. It's a very user-friendly method of fishing. Now what I like to do is, is, once I've got the pellets in there, I'll just pop the bait close to it on the back there. A few more over the top. And that's it, simple as that, it's just good to go. As soon as it hits the water, it starts expanding. Can't see that, move on. Start pecking away at it. Out there comes the, the hoop bait. Hook the cells on the feeder, just a little prick, bolt the cells and off they go. It's a really simple, effective way of fishing. That cast, just had a cast really tight to the island and sure enough, it's gone off, it looks like they fit the, they are feeding right to the island today. This, uh, as I said earlier, this rod I'm using there, this little 10 foot is absolutely ideal for this water. But Corum now do a full range of feeder rods uh, from this, this 10 foot, ideal for the little commercial, all the way down to a 13 foot feeder rod, which is absolutely ideal for distance fishing. If you're throwing a heavy feeder out fishing for, for large bream, so the entire range is covered and you can really fish for everything using the new Corum feeder rods. I'm fishing today on using the Corum accessory chair. It's uh, a really, really nice bit of kit. When you fish on waters like this, you'll see most people fishing with a seat box, which is, which is absolutely fine, but um, I prefer the comfort of a more traditional chair. And this one is well, if you like, it's probably a kind of hybrid between a seat box and a traditional specialist chair. Uh, fully adjustable four legs, all the adapters, feeder arm, bait trays, everything, all nicely to hand. Just makes it a really comfortable day's fishing. Whether you're sat in a commercial like this or, or you're fishing on a big gravel pit or even on the rivers, the adjustable legs means that you can use this chair on any water and feel comfortable. I think particularly like the, the side tray just keeps everything to hand, baits, hooks, rigs, forceps, even if it's a nice day, maybe even a, a can of beer. Look at that, there we go. Give it, really lean into this one a bit now. Try and get him in. Little mirror this one. This one's giving a Pretty good account of himself. So much so, I'm gonna have to gain a bit more line. There we go. There we go, we turned in now. That should be him. Yeah, there we go. That's another one. Nice fish. Nice way of fishing. Let's get him back. snag on the corner of that island which this chap actually tried to get in 
I managed to stop him. And then we're out. So hopefully we're away from the danger now. This is a, I've just changed rods and reels. This is the 11 foot feeder rod, three piece. So uh, easier to store, easier to transport. Um, similar kind of action. You can see there's plenty of, plenty of power in it. And it there you go. Oh, he's off. And I kind of got him away from that snag pretty early, so there's plenty of fight left in this one, I think. It's, it's funny, there's, there's one little snag on that island and pretty much every fish you hook goes straight for it. They know it's there. It feels like a bigger fish, but it's difficult to tell because it did most of its fighting under the rod tip. So this is on the Jura feeder. And again with the Sonia Bates oozing boiler. It's positioned on the top of it using the Jura mould. And uh, just a little touch of lava, this lava flavour in it. Puts a nice cloud around your method feeder, draws fish in. Obviously worked. Yeah. Now this reel's called the Rodiac. It's a smallish reel, but it's got the bait runner facility on it. This one's fighting really hard now. Ah, it's making me arm ache. Away from danger. I think the only danger near me now is the platform itself. It's certainly hard fighting. Come on, there we go. Oh no, nearly. fighting fish here. There we go. That's got him. Nice common carp. I can see why it fought so well. Long, oh yeah, yeah. Long fish. Powerful tail. Great fun. That was the, uh, the Jura feeder. Did the business. Nice, let's get him back. Okay, what I've decided to do now, I'm getting loads of little taps on the method feeder, which I think might be a uh, silver fish, because we did get that bream early, and I think a lot of these commercial waters, there's, there's more to them than carp, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be some good roach out there, decent roach and skimmers, so I've come off the method feeder now, and I've put on one of these swivel grub feeders, and I'm just fishing a simple running rig uh, with a couple of maggots on the hook. Um, like I say, getting lots of little taps and bumps out there, so I'm guessing there's some smaller um, silver fish over the bait. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, open this, get this set up. Just put a few maggots in. I'm going to fish the same place that I've been casting to, because I think they will move over the feed that's been going in off the method. So I'm going to drop it in off the end of that island, and then we'll just watch the tip. It'd be interesting to see if there are a few roach about right there. That's just about right. Just slowly tighten it up. Oh, there's something tapping at it almost straight away. I'm 
no, I think I missed that. No, I didn't miss it. I perhaps caught the smallest fish in the, oh, good gin. <laughs> Not quite what I had in mind, but I did say there was all kinds of fish in this water. But it was a bit of a tippy tappy bite. It was nice to catch a good gin. A fish that a lot of us grew up on as kids. It's shown there's more to these commercials than, than catching carp all day. Be pretty fish. See what else is out there. Might have a bit of fun on the maggot now. Coming to the end of the day now. We've caught on a pretty much every type of feeder rig we've tried, we've caught on. The grub feeders, the easy feeders, everything we've tried we've had fish. Now this one is determined to get under. So I'm just going to step out a little bit to keep it away from the platform legs. Wind's getting up now. There we go. Not the biggest fish we've caught today. That'll do. Little mirror. He wants to go back. Well, that was going to be my last fish, but like anglers anywhere, I can't resist one last cast. So that's what I'm going to have. Let's see if I can get one more before I go home. So that's what you get when you have one last cast. That took almost straight away. I think that's definitely time to end the session. Pretty little common. Okay, it's my turn now. I've just hooked a carp on the float gear. Just float fishing a bit of prawn down the inside there over a bit of ground bait. And um, hope you've just enjoyed watching uh, Gary Knowles catching all those fish on various feeder setups. Bit of a master class. And what we're going to do now, we're going to go and uh, have a look at Di Gribble, who's fishing on a flooded River Seven um, for some barbel. And even though the conditions are pretty dreadful, I think he'll do all right. So if I can get this one in now, I'll be happy too. Yeah, bit of, bit of prawn hanging out of its mouth. That's it, it's in the net, lovely jubbly. Today we're on the River Severn. The original plan was to come fishing for chub, roving around, but unfortunately the river's been up in flood. We've had incessant rain, it seems, for about two weeks now. So you could perhaps see on the 
the app that the Environment Agency provide that the levels are up, they're dropping now, but uh, we've still got seven feet on, so the river's far more suited to fishing for barbel. So today I'm going to show you hopefully how to catch some floodwater barbel. Right, what I'm going to show you here is the mix that I'm putting in my feeder today for the floodwater barbel fishing. It's called Barbel Feeder from So New Baits. It's a mixture of pellets and it comes with a tin of hemp and meat. So, and it's very simple to mix. All you do is you tip your hemp and meat in and then you just need to add the, another tin full of just water. And, and then it's just a case of mixing it all up, keeping it moving. And what you'll end up with is a nice sticky mix that will stick in an open-ended feeder. You'll quite often have some of this left back in your feeder at the end of the cast if you mix it correctly. Right, I'm just going to show you the end tackle I'm using today. I've got 12 pound feeder line as the main line, nice and strong. And then I've got a Corum feeder kit. So a running rig with a sleeve that just offsets it that runs over a swivel. And I'm using a quick change swivel and I'll show you that in a minute. And then the feeder is a four ounce feeder, open-ended that I can then pack with the barbel mix. Uh, so it's nice and firm in there and then just breaks off little by little giving a nice trail because you don't want it to come out in a hurry or it all goes off downstream and then what I tend to use now is a loop on the end of my hook lengths and then a nice simple sleeve that just slides over the quick change swivel that means I can change my hook bait very easily and the hook length so if I want a longer hook length and what I've got here is you see I've got meat directly on the hook uh, that's often a good tip in flood water if there's a lot of debris coming down because it buries the hook and you don't get leaves and weed and things catching on your hook. Uh, but other times I can then swap that nice and easily for a hair rigged uh, hook length with a boilie or a pellet on it. Excellent. I love the sound of the drag. Well, this one's going to go a bit because it's in about 20 feet of water and it's flowing very fast at times. So, I think it's fair to say it's not a chub. Yeah. Got very fast water coming across with all the boils on but underneath in much deeper water it's fairly slow and static so it's just fishing right under our feet in the flood water and uh, we were just beginning to wonder whether to go and look for another swim but the rod's just hooped over and hopefully we'll have one in the net soon. There we are. Straight in. Excellent. I'm going to leave him in the net for a bit and then we'll get the unhooking mat and the forceps out. Let him recover after the fight. Not the biggest of barbel and it looks like he might have had an encounter with an otter looking at that tail but it didn't stop him fighting quite well in the fast water. It's probably what, four pounds? Uh, far better than sitting at home thinking, I can't go fishing today, it's too high, I'm not going to bother. Just remember, they're always barbel, whatever the level will be feeding, as long as it's not too cold. So we'll just pop him back.
Right, this is a selection of the sort of hook baits I use when floodwater barbel fishing. Just a sort of drilled pellet, uh, boilies, I quite like broken boilies, back to back you get a bit more leakage out of them. And luncheon meat, luncheon meat's very good because you can vary the size of it very easily. And the other good thing is you can bury the hook in it, which if you've got a lot of leaves or debris coming down on the bottom of the river, it keeps, them, uh, keeps the hook clear of being ended up covered in leaves. With the meat, I often flavour it. I've got a couple of favourites. The lunch meat liquid is very, very good. It gives it just a, it's more of a bacony flavour, in fact. The spicy sausage has been very successful for barbel for a number of years now. And this is a new one, which is actually a pellet oil, which was originally designed for making pellet feed pellets sink for match anglers, but it actually is a sinking oil. So what you get is a trail of flavour coming off your bait that actually sits on the bed of the river rather than floating up through the water column. So I've got great hopes that that is going to be a really good additive on uh, any bait, particularly in flood conditions. Right, so those are the baits. So we're going to try and put them into practice and catch a few more barbel. I think it's as big as the last one, but just got to be careful when in the flooded water because you're often netting the fish over what would normally be dry banks, so there'll be a lot of dead vegetation there. Out the brambles. Not as big, but absolutely mint condition. The sun very pale in the flood water. Fin perfect, look at that. We've talked a lot about rigs and bait, but probably much more important is actually where you put the bait. Uh, in flood water, sometimes it's, some of swims are very obvious where you've got a nice crease and slow water. Others, you're looking for a more smooth, steady paced water. Swim I'm in, just moving into now, we've got some very fast water coming beyond the trees and then it slows up and then I've got very still water right in front of me. And the area I'm aiming for is just where the sort of, current starts to increase because that's where the food will be coming down for the barbel so we're looking to put it at bait where we think the barbel will be lying up and that will change with different levels of the flood when it's really really in flood they're going to be much closer in under the feet particularly if it's been in flood for a long time whereas the first flush of a flood they might be out in the middle of the river because they've got lots of energy they haven't been subject to high flows but as the flood progresses they're more likely to move into the slacker slower water so what we've had recently is a lot of lot of rainfall where it's dropped but it's still what we would call in flood compared to normal levels so i think the barbel are likely to be in the slightly slower water uh, which is why i'm going to be aiming for a crease that's just slightly inside of the main flow so we'll see how we get on. We'll get one out there and then we'll put the other one a bit further down.
Right, well, all the gear is back in the car now. We've had a great day on the bank, a couple of barbel in the net, and hopefully showing that however inclement the conditions might look, you can always got a good chance of a barbel. Flood fishing it can be great fun, just take care, because when it, the rivers can rise very quickly and just be safe. Good luck. Okay, well, the action's hotting up for us too over here, getting a few carp now. Um, hope you enjoyed watching Die catch some barbel there. I think he did very well in difficult conditions. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to pop this fish back and we're going to go and have a look at Aunt Molly now, who's going to show you ways of catching some pike. Let's go and see how he gets on. Okay, so we're on a little estate lake today. We're gonna to be doing a little bit of lure fishing for pike. All I've got with me is two rods, a very small box of lures. So let's see what we can catch. Right, so what I'm gonna start off by doing is just fan casting around the swim. So I'm gonna start off here to my right and try and search out the depths, try and find out where the pike are lying. And the lure that I've decided to start with today is a Corum drone. It's one of the small ones. And the reason why I like to start off with the drone is because it's a sinking lure, I can very quickly gauge the depth. So all I do is cast in, count down, how long it takes for the lure to hit the bottom and that will give me a rough idea of how deep the swim is in front of me. You know I've never fished this place before so it's a good way of finding out where the marginal shelf is, how deep it is in the middle. And with it being nice and bright and orange it of course attracts the pike. So we'll make another cast just slightly bit more to the left, count it down, still sinking, it's quite deep out there, there we go, it's just hit the bottom now. So what that tells me is that as it comes round to the left, the lake sort of bowls out in the middle. I would say, given how long it took to hit the bottom there, I would probably say that it's about 12 foot in depth. It's quite mild today. But we are just coming out of the back end of the winter, it's late February and the water is still quite cold so I have a sneaking suspicion that the pipe will be lying up on the bottom still, not really moving around, you know it's probably going to take another couple of weeks before they're very active and getting ready for spawning and at times like this it's imperative that you find out where they are lying up. A little bit of weed on the lure there. If you do get anything like that, just clean it off before you cast it back out. It can affect the action of the lure. So a bit more around to the left again. Straight out in front of me. Count it down. Okay there, just hit the bottom there. So it's a similar depth to the last cast that I made. You know, the lure's sort of coming up and then dropping back down and coming up and dropping back down. I want to keep it as close to the bottom as possible in this swim. Oh, little knock there. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that didn't take very long at all. That was literally the third cast. And we are into a pike. I don't think it's the biggest fish that I've ever caught. Ooh, angry, Mr. Angry. There we are, get him in the net. Yes. Okay, right, let's have a little look at him. 
So I've got the unhooking mat on the staging already. I carry this everywhere that I go. You know, it makes life much easier for yourself and obviously it's much safer for the pipe too. So I'll show you now how to unhook him properly and safely. You know, I see a lot of people fishing for pike and they're not, they're not very confident in handling them. You know, if, if you're not that confident in handling them, you know, you shouldn't really be fishing for them. Um, but there's nothing to worry about. Now, the way I do it, see this line, this V-shape that's underneath its, its head? These are his gill plates. Now, what I do is put my fingers in there, slide it up to this V, and then you can get a real nice purchase on there to handle the pike. And it's important to carry the correct tools as well. So I carry these long nose pliers. I also carry a pair of big cutters as well in case I do need to cut any of the hooks off. But looking at the way this guy's hooked, I don't think we're gonna need them to unhook him. So just very carefully work your way point by point. So as you can see there, that one's come off in the net. It's actually caught in the net, but we can deal with that later. So just find where he's hooked. So he's got the big treb the big single through there. So just carefully, mind his teeth. And there you go, he's free. So just carefully, again, mind his teeth. Point's just gone back in there. So again, carefully just unhook that one. And there we are. Simple as that, nothing to worry about. If the pipe was to start thrashing around, you've got a good tight grip of him there. And there he is none the worse for wear perfect little specimen not the biggest one that i've ever caught but who cares when they look like this i'm going to get him back now continue working the swim i've only had three casts remember so we'll continue working the swim see if we can figure out what else is going on down there and uh, see if there's any more obliging pike that like an orange drone Perfect. Well, there we are. Got another cast towards the shallower part. I've, I've fan casted around. I've worked my way towards the left of the swim now on the orange drone. Might be slightly better fish. Ooh, taking a bit of line. There we are, another one absolutely inhaled really wanted that one fish number two so what we did was we continued to fan cast around the swim working our way from right to left so we started off casting into some deeper water which was probably between 10 and 13 feet and what we found is the the further across to the left that you go towards the island it starts to come up a bit shallower so maybe the fish have started moving around getting ready thinking about spawning um, yeah so it was this was the first cast into about six to seven feet of water and uh, absolutely inhaled the orange goldfish drone yet again so what we'll do is we'll get this little fella back and i'll talk to you a little bit more about why i've chose to use the drones Colour choice, massively important when you lure fishing. And a lot of you might be thinking, why am I throwing around something bright orange? And the answer is quite simple, water clarity. The water here today is quite coloured. It's sort of, the lake itself sits in the bottom of, of a bowl around some farmer's fields. So when it rains, all the soil and the mud off the land runs in. 
makes the water coloured. So if I was using something sort of naturally coloured, like a roach pattern or a perch pattern or even a pike pattern, something like that, it wouldn't really stand out too well in the water. Whereas with something bright like an orange goldfish like I'm using now, another good one to use is something yellow or a fire tiger pattern say. Um, it just helps the pike to be able to see the lure in the water. Um, you know the drones are very good in themselves with the big rubber tail, beats away, creates a lot of vibration and movement in the water which helps to attract the pike, you know not just visually but by sort of vibrations through the water. Um, but you know you need you know when it's tough you need to do any everything that you can really to ensure that uh, you know your bait stands out above anything else that's in the lake hence the reason why i'm using a bright orange goldfish pattern lure and i, I really do like using these soft sort of rubber bodied lures i do think that um, the pike do really keep hold of them when they bite feels more like a natural fish than something hard, you know, hard lures do have the place in, in fishing, of course. But, you know, personally, I really do like fishing with the rubber lures. So we'll carry on working this swim for a few more minutes. I'll have probably another couple of fan casts, this time from left to right, going back over the ground that I've already covered. See if we can pick up another fish. If not, we'll move on. Okay, so we've worked the swim. Again, fan casting from left to right this time. Gone back over the ground that we just covered. Unfortunately, we didn't pick anything else up. So we'll make the most of the opportunity. I'm gonna go back round to the, to the left-hand side now, where the water shallows up. You know, the sun's quite strong now. I've got a funny feeling that they might have slightly moved up into that shallower water. So we'll go and work the shallow bay now. Okay, so we've just walked round to the first accessible swim in the shallow side of the lake. And I'm gonna start off in this swim using the heavier setup. And I've got a couple of reasons for that. First of all, I've got a nice reed line down to my right. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite a far cast to sort of get it towards right up against the reeds. The other reason why I've moved over to the bigger setup is the takes that I were getting in the last swim were very, very aggressive. The, the, the small pike were absolutely inhaling the lures. So I think we might be able to get away with using that bigger lure. So I'm gonna stick with the same one that I was using in the last swim. I've just moved up to a bigger size. So this is a large drone, still sticking with the orange goldfish pattern because the water in here is even more colored. So we'll have a few cast around and see what we can catch. Okay, so I've had a few casts around the swim with the orange drone. Doesn't really seem to be working in this swim. I've had a good few fan casts, uh, two or three times up and down the swim, not had a touch. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna swap over to one of our hard lures, one of the double hard lures. I'm gonna try this fire tiger pattern. Now these lures, made of a hard plastic rather than a soft plastic. They have a big vein on the front of them and when you cast them in, as you'll see in a second, they'll actually lay on the surface of the water. Then when you start retrieving, the vein will kick into action, start working its way down through the water column. It is quite shallow up in this bay and what I've found is with the uh, drones, when I'm casting in, it's sinking to the bottom. I'm picking up quite a lot of debris from the bottom uh, so I shouldn't have the same issues with this. So I'll give this a few fan casts and see what happens.
the action's dried up a little bit the sun's got quite high in the sky now so i just thought i'd take this opportunity to talk you through the two rods that i take spinning with me and the reasons why so we'll start off with the lighter one that we started off with this morning this is the seven foot quorum speed spin rod casting weight is five to twenty grams so that means that it's suitable for casting lures between five and twenty grams i use this in 90% of situations I would say this is my sort of go-to rod. I'm not a fan of massive really heavy sort of spinning rods generally speaking although they do certainly have the place in uh, in lure fishing. Um, now my favourite lure to fish on this setup is a small orange drone. I've caught so many fish on this as you can probably see it's absolutely battered it's falling to pieces should really change it but it's kind of a lucky lure really. Um, the other sort of lures that I'll fish are the shallow bugs, mid-water double hard lures too. I've got this coupled with a Quorum feeder reel. This is the 3000 size. It's really smooth clutch, performs really well. This is the sort of thing that you need really when you're lure fishing. Just a good, solid, reliable reel. I've used this for quite a while and I've never had any issues with it whatsoever and I'll continue to do so. Uh, on the spool I've got some light braid, this is 10 pound Corum braid, it's more than heavy enough for this small setup that I use, you know I don't like to go too heavy with the braid, I like the, the diameter, it just cuts through the water, you get a direct contact with, with the lure, uh, don't tend to use any mono at all when I'm sort of lure fishing, it does take the feeling away with the stretch in the mono, if you're new to lure fishing I would strongly suggest using braid you'll you'll hook up with more fish you'll be in direct contact with what's going on down under the surface now the next setup that i've been using today this is a slightly bigger rod this is nine foot from the same range of rods quorum speed this has got a casting weight of 12 to 45 grams and this is ideal for casting some bigger lures slightly heavier like the deep diving double hard lures and uh, the bigger size drones you know if i if i do need to cast a little bit further um you know then this this is this will be the one that i'll that i'll go to really this is coupled with a again quorum feeder reel this is the next size up though the 4000 size and on the reel i've got some thicker braid on this not really for sort of catching any bigger fish more just for casting and being able to take the shock of the cast with the bigger lures so i've stepped this one up to 25 pound there are situations where, yes, of course, you'll need heavier braid if you're doing any jerkbait fishing. Uh, I don't tend to do a lot of that myself. Uh, so these are the two setups that I'll take sort of anywhere with me on, uh, on a day session lure fishing. So we'll continue fishing. I'm going to continue using this one for now in the shallow bay. Give it another few minutes. Again, if we've not had anything, we're going to move on, possibly go back round to the deeper side. It seems to be where all the action was this morning. So we might... Uh, head off back down there shortly. Right, so we're back down in the deep end. Wasn't really happening up there in the shallows just yet, so I decided to move back down here. This is where we had the action from this morning, so it makes sense really. We've got a bit of nice cloud coming over now, so Hopefully, we'll give it the last hour in these few swims along this bank in the deeper water and see if we can catch another one. Right, well we've worked this swim, there's not a lot happening here, so we're going to head back down to the swim that we fished this morning, see if we can get a last gas pike. Wicked fish, not the biggest one I've ever caught, but who cares on a light rod and a small lure like I've just caught this one on, it doesn't really matter. Right, let's get this one back, see if we can catch a bigger one. Right, 
Right, well that was my last cast for today. Had a real nice day down here on the estate lake. Caught a few pike using a few different things. And I hope that we've uh, we've shown you a few things about lure fishing. It's not too technical. Anybody can do it. It's relatively cheap and you can catch some awesome fish doing so. So we're gonna head off back to the car now and we'll be back down here sometime soon. Well, we're having fun in the sun and we're catching some lovely carp we're on the float in the sunshine. What could be better? But of course, we've got to thank Aunt Molyneux for catching us some pike in the winter. Much harder than what I'm doing. And now, next part of the DVD, we're going to join Kevin Durman, who's going to catch us some carp more conventionally. And I'm going to get this one in. This looks like a lovely common that we caught right down the edge on a little bit of prawn again. I do like those prawns. Let's see if we can get this one in. When do they ever give up? When do they ever give up? When do they ever give up? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> Uh, yibbity yibbity folks, as Wrexham would say, and uh, thank you very much. We're here today at uh, Manor Farm Fishery in Biggleswade. It's the middle of March, it's cold, it's a cold northerly blowing. But we've had this one already and uh, I'm going to show you some tips and tactics so that you can get a few of these fish on the bank too. Let's get this one back and see if we can catch some more. So let's have a look at the bait uh, that I'm going to spot out for this session. I'm down for a day and a night, so I do want to put something out there, but I don't want to put too much out that it's going to fill the fish up. I just want a bit of attraction. I've got a couple of the new Sonny Baits bits and pieces to use. I've got some of the uh, cooked hemp and chili flakes, and I've got some of the oily pellet mix. Um, that water being so cold, being in the middle of March, I'm not going to put much of the oily pellet out, just a handful of that. Mix sizes of pellets there and then a, a couple of handfuls of the hemp and chilli flakes. So there's lots of attraction there. I've always uh, done very well on the hemp and chilli flakes. A bit of colour, a little bit of the F1 corn. Not a lot, it's half a handful. And uh, I've got some 24 7 12 mil boilies, little ones. Again, just a handful. and then some of the clear pellet oil. It's a very thin oil, it's going to give lots of smell and attraction. Good squirt of that. So there you go, it's not a lot, but this time of year I don't want to put a lot out. I'm just going to put three or four spots of that out and um, see where we go from there. So I've used my marker rod and uh, not found any features out in the lake at all. Once you go over the marginal shelf, it's just uh, a nice level, level bottom as far as I can cast. So I'm just going to pick a nice comfortable spot and uh, get my two fishing rods and my spod rod all marked up at the same distance. One, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half, that's my distance. I'm going to clip the spool up, so it's that one done. Just need to get some marker elastic on there and uh, 
do the other rod and then the spod rod and then we're going to get some bait in. Well, there you go, that's a chunky little mirror there. Fishing's been really hard. That cold northerly has really put pay to a good session. So I'm quite pleased with just another bite really. Uh, when we got here it was a nice southerly blowing and then within a few hours it changed to northerly and uh, all the shows stopped. I've had to go and try and find some fish, had a couple of moves and I think we're gonna get this one back and then move again, see if we can find some more. This one was on a braided hair rig, core and braided hair rig. I'm going to show you how to set that up now and uh, how we've managed to get this bite. Let's, let's get her back. This is the Corum braided hair rig. Uh, in the kit, you get a lead clip and tail rubber, you get your quick stop needle, there's the rig with a quick stop attached to the end and there's a quick change swivel. Now it's a nice supple rig, it's a small hook, I think this is going to be the rig that's going to trick the fish today. So let's have a look at how we tie one up. These rigs are designed for one knot fishing, so let's get everything tied up. First thing that goes on is the tail rubber. There she is. Next up is the lead clip. And then the rig itself. So that line through the uh, quick change swivel. I like a five knot grinner. Here's my loop formed. One, two, three, four. Five. Just moisten that a little bit. Pull it tight. That slides down. It's a nice strong knot that. I use that knot for just about everything. Trim off a little bit of waste. The clip now gets pushed over your quick change swivel. The lead is attached. And the tail rubber is pushed on. Just going to push that on lightly. Now for the bait. Quick stop needle goes into the quick stop. That's pushed through the bait. This is a 24-7 wafter. Turn it sideways. So that is almost ready to cast out. There's just one more thing I do. And that is attach a little stocking. Just so there's something near the hook bait. There we go, that's ready to cast out and catch us some fish. Simple one knot fishing. Uh, it's a small commercial water, the lake I'm fishing today, so I don't need big powerful rods. Uh, there's no cast further than 40 or 50 yards, 
so I'm using the 10 foot core and cart rod with a two and a half pound test curve. Reels, I'm using the Rodiac 6000. It's uh, just the right size, compatible with the rod. And I've loaded that with 12 pound expert line. There's 20 pounders in here, so I don't want to be undergunned. For bite indication, I'm using the KBI indicator. Got the receiver with me, as I've been fishing overnight, so I've had the receiver in my bivvy and been carrying around with me in my pocket. And uh, for the actual visual indication, I'm using the bite indicator kit. Um, comes with a weight on there as well, but because I'm fishing quite close in, I'm fishing the lines a little bit slack just so I can see any, any line bites. So I might know where the fish are. So that's the equipment I'm using. We've had a few fish. Let's see if we can catch a few more. Well, we've had another move, and uh, an hour or so into the move, we've had another fish. Lovely little scaly mirror on the Coram braided hair rig. Here we go. Let's get him back. Might be one or two more out there before we go. Our time at Manor Farm Fishery has come to an end. We've managed to catch a few fish by working hard, uh, moved a few times. Hopefully the tips and tactics we've shown you will help you in your own angling. And good luck. I'll see you next time. Okay, we've uh, just had this beauty again on the float, which is absolutely terrific, lovely common. Um, and at this stage I say thanks very much to Kevin who's been uh, showing us how to catch some carp in more conventional methods and uh, I'm going to go and have a look around the lake see if I can find a couple more somewhere and I'll see you later. Well, we've had a fantastic day. In the sunshine, lovely and warm, catching plenty of big carp, brilliant. We hope you've enjoyed the film. We've had a lot of fun making it. Special thanks to all the consultants who've revealed their secrets, given their time to do it. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, the Quorum channel, on the Quorum page. Get out there, enjoy your fishing. I'm Chris Ponsford for Quorum. Thanks very much again. See you on the bank.